And um, I'm going to start by sort of asking what a very basic question here. What is mathematics? So Bertrand Russell said, all mathematics is symbolic logic. But a lot of mathematicians, I don't know if you want to think of Einstein as a mathematician, but he's like a mathematician, think differently. And they have ideas like this one. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant as, and has forgotten the gift. So um, many mathematicians feel this way. They feel that intuition is the source of you know, the theorems that they think are true and the intuitions they have as to why they are true. And um, you know, our former provost, John Echemende, uh, and John Barweis, another colleague of his in philosophy, um, had the idea that when it, the only thing that the symbolic stuff is for is exactly this servant role, is to write down what you, is to find a way of convincingly demonstrating through a series of formal expressions something that you know, is known to you in your intuition. And um, so that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in these intuitions. I got interested in these intuitions because a man who was in my department before I joined it, Roger Shepard, introduced me to an intuitive proof of the famous Pythagorean theorem. Um, you guys all probably remember what the theorem says. It basically states that uh, if we have a right triangle here, the square of the hypotenuse, that's the side opposite the right angle, is equal to the sum of the squares of the two sides. <laughs> The theorem could be written as an equation. Burton Russell would like that. Relating the lengths of the sides A, B, and C, uh, often called the Pythagorean equation, where C is the hypotenuse, that's that specific side, and A and B are the lengths of the other two sides. Okay? That's the Pythagorean theorem. Now, the Pythagorean theorem was actually uh, is deeply mysterious to many people, and there's many proofs of it out there, and some of them are very sort of formal seeming, and the, as you read through them, they don't make a lot of sense. But when I was attending Roger Shepard's lecture, uh, I saw him show a little video that's very similar to this one, and so I'm going to show it to you now. Whoops. You're not seeing it, are you? Nope. You're hearing the music. <laughs> so I tested this beforehand, but it was before I um, went into dual screen mode. So I have to move this over to the other screen and escape. I hope you're not ducking my time for this. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good. Now let's try it. Understand the Pythagorean theorem now? <laughs> um, I felt like I did. I don't know if I should have felt that way. Uh, formal proof is always required to justify this. Whoops. <laughs> 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 
how? <laughs> Where's my presentation? <laughs> Back to here. Uh, right. Um, I sort of felt I understood this intuitively in a way that I had never really felt I, or at least I couldn't remember ever understanding it before. I have to admit it was many years from the time I studied it in high school until the time I saw the movie. But it still, it really hit me um, that I could intuitively understand that this theorem must be true without any of those uh, symbolic expressions or formal logic. And um, what, what was I, what was causing that? Um, so a couple of things seem to be fundamental to this. One is this notion of the conservation or the preservation of a property um, of shape and uh, area under translation and rotation, right? All those little triangles, they get copied. You know, you make copies of them. They're the same, you clone them, and then you rotate them, and they're still the same, right? It's still the same shape. It still takes up the same amount of space. And then you construct this big square in which you have this square of area size C, and then you move around the triangles inside the big square, and lo and behold, these two other squares show up, and they happen to be the you know, squares that are the lengths of the other sides of the triangle. So it's like the difference of the whole area is the same, and you've subtracted the same bits from it. You've just moved them around. So it must be true that the area that was there originally in C squared is equal to the area that's now there in A squared and B squared. I'm just saying things explicitly that my intuitive mind sort of kind of somehow said, yeah, that's got to be true, right? It's, uh, those are the things that I must do, basing this on. And we don't, we don't feel like we need conscious access to this. And when, when the math teacher is explaining stuff, you know, he's always got to rely on these intuitions to take the next step, or else the whole class is like always lost at every step of the argument. So um, one way I have to think about this is that we're always relying on intuition uh, when we're understanding any kind of mathematical argument. And reducing it to proof is a laborious and interesting, uh, complicated process. It's interesting, but maybe like Einstein said, it's not the main thing. So now, we have the next question, which is where do these intuitions come from? And uh, Roger Shepard himself and his disciple Stan DeHane. Stan um, was a very strong protagonist of Shepard's work and is, is currently still very active in the field. He's a, uh, a leader of, in the field of cognitive science in Europe. Uh, and he had a colleague who wrote this, there is now considerable evidence that space, time, and number are part of the essential toolkits that adults share with infants and with many other non-human animals. We're born with these intuitions, um, and that's what Shepard thought as well. Empirical evidence from evolutionary development, linguistic, and cognitive and brain sciences is established beyond any doubt that individuals come into the world already adapted to some important features of the world in which they must make their ways. So he was dismissing an empiricist argument with this statement. Um, and I knew he was deliberately taunting me because I'm an empiricist, uh, probably the most rapid empiricist you're ever going to meet. Um, I, you know, so I, I say that um, hopefully with uh, tongue in cheek. I don't, you know, I look at my own body, I look at my eyes and my ears and the organs of uh, sensation and digestion and motion and so on, and I realize evolution has endowed me with all of these very basic uh, physical tools. But when it comes to my uh, advanced cognitive abilities, I'm, I'm slow to accept that they were prepared for us in advance. Especially in domains like abstract mathematics where um, there are ideas that didn't exist before humans came along and started thinking about it. And that's not the Platonic view, of course. Plato thought they were already there. Somehow or other, they came into our minds. He was a rationalist, so were these guys. Sort of somehow there in our nature that we would know them. Uh, but there's an alternative perspective. Um, and that is the idea that experience could help shape these intuitions. And so how does this relate to embodiment? Well, one kind of experience would be experience with physical objects and the effects of our actions on those objects. 
So on this view, our intuition might correspond um, to the intuitions we have when we're thinking about mathematical problems might correspond to an exploration of the effects of imagined action, perhaps supported by actual physical manipulation some of the time, and by our previous acts of imagining that and acting in the world that gave us the knowledge to do this imagination. Okay? So I manipulate objects in the world, I, know, I learn about the consequences of my actions, I then build an internal model of the way my actions affect the world, and then when I imagine, I'm just running that model. It's an acquired mental model based on my learned experience from interacting with the world. Um, so, this is a, an idea which, um, you know, can be built on in the actual construction of um, geometry uh, um, teaching materials. And this woman, Kristen Kamenga, is an educator who has done just that. She was a disciple of another person who was a professor of mathematics at Cornell University who tragically died um, just last year in a uh, traffic accident. But he, he wrote a book about geometry in which um, the definition of a proof was an argument you could explain to someone and they would understand it. And the kinds of things he asked you to do when you thought about a mathematical problem were to envision yourself doing something, like you're an ant walking on the surface of a sphere. If, if the step size you take on both sides is always the same on both sides, you'll sort of go along a straight line around the sphere and you'll follow the great circle around the sphere. But if you make bigger steps on one side than the other, you'll find yourself going around a little tight loop and you won't make that great circle around the whole sphere. And this is his way of introducing us to, you know, non-Euclidean geometry. Well, mostly we live in an approximately Euclidean world. <laughs> For all practical purposes, the floor here is flat, the table here is flat, you know, that's good. Um, and uh, so, in fact, people thought the world was flat, right? Until uh, such time as Columbus began to convince them that they were wrong. But, um, but what Carmenga argues for, and what um, her mentor also argued for, is this idea that we, we actually can build up our formal understanding of, of uh, concepts in mathematics and geometry by actually thinking about transformations um, and uh, their, uh, how they bring things into correspondence as a way of proving the validity of mathematical uh, uh, propositions. So here is Carmenga's proof of the angle side angle theorem in geometry. What does this theorem mean? We're given that angle A is congruent to angle A prime, and that uh, line segment AC is congruent to line segment AC prime, and angle C is congruent to angle C prime. There's the prime for angle C prime. And we want to prove that the triangles themselves are congruent. How do we do that? We translate A to bring it into correspondence to A prime. We rotate this triangle until AC coincides with A prime C prime. Now we know that they're the same length so that when the when this endpoint and the edge coincide, the endpoints are also going to coincide. Uh, Oops. We then reflect over this line, if necessary. You guys are imagining this, right? You can see that triangle here. But we're going to reflect over that edge, if necessary. And in this case, it is necessary. Um, and then the whole triangles coincide, right? So that line is going to land on top of this one, and that line is going to land on top of this one. You know, there's a few more steps to sort of being sure it's really true. Um, because the angles correspond, the other sides are going to lie in the same place. And so, <coughs> so um, yeah. Um, and 
she even argues that this is how Euclid really approached the problem. So she's relying here very explicitly in her presentation on the notion that we have this intuitive understanding of these preservations of area and shape of your translation and location. And all we've got to do is sort of say, well, you know, you're right about that. That justifies it's still the same, so you don't have to worry about that changing anything. Uh, but, but it's building straight on your intuitions, and therefore you'd be able to understand it better if that happens. So this is a, a, a theory, and um, my goal here is to sort of figure out how I could um, build systems that would somehow learn these intuitions. So what kinds of learning systems might acquire these kinds of intuitions? Well, in people in the 70s figured out how to write computer programs that could solve any integral differential equation using symbolic programming language. But those programming languages didn't learn anything. They were programmed by the guys who already knew all the theorems. And um, uh, you know, learning was always the sort of a weak point of this sort of the symbolic approach to representing uh, knowledge. So when Herb Simon said in 1953 he programmed a computer to think, he programmed a computer to think exactly the way he thought you should think. I've got five more minutes. Better hurry up. So I got a different solution. He didn't, Herb didn't like the solution. Um, other people at Carnegie Mellon actually voted to hire me over Herb's basically dead body, but he lived 10 more years, so he argued with me quite a bit. Um, but here's my approach I'm using neural networks. Uh, as Piero mentioned, I've been using neural networks since uh, 1978. We started doing uh, our work on that when we published our two volume book in 86. Um, and they've come up a long way, but they're still very similar to what they were before. They're devices that take inputs, and in the, in the world of this kind of uh, current implementations, they take bitmap images of, the, of a display, a computer display. Um, in this work, they, they were bitmap images of an Atari computer from back in the 70s where the images weren't particularly complicated. They weren't that many pixels, but they were just the raw images nevertheless. They put them in the input, and this is a simple neural network that basically it has these units that are like neurons that add up the inputs they get from other neurons, and if the input exceeds a threshold, they send out a signal, and they propagate the signal forward, and um, at the output side, they vote on which action is the one that's going to be the best one to take to sort of do better at playing some little computer game. And um, gradually, they get feedback from the world telling them what moves led to, led to points in the game. And as they keep playing these games over and over again, they develop intuitions about what moves to make. And um, the man behind all this is a man named Demis Sasabis, who was a brilliant uh, young chess master growing up. And he wanted, you know, the thing that he decided he wanted to know when he was an adult was how come he could have insights into what move to make in chess. You know, what allowed that? He, he just couldn't really imagine that symbolic logic stuff doing it. And so he built this company called D-Mind that, that, you know, convinced people to fund him to explore these ideas about where this stuff comes from. It comes from learning, from general purpose things that's grounded in the actual inputs in the world and our actions on them and it's active instead of passive. So I was, of course, completely convinced by this. Um, so how do I proceed? I'm going to tell you a little bit of work that I've done and I'll try to get it in in five minutes. Um, it, it involves um, something which I think of as a very embodied kind of opportunity that young children have to learn something about geometry, which is, um, a shape sorter. Right? This is a, a physical shape sorter that you could buy on Amazon or uh, any other provider of toys. Um, and uh, what it involves is a bunch of blocks and a bunch of cutouts in a box such that if you pick up the block and position it correctly, it will fall through a hole in the box. 
one of my um, students uh, decided with me, we decided to uh, develop a computer game version of this in two dimensions. So we had um, manipulable shapes, which are red, and we had cutout shapes in the background of the world, which are black. And uh, the, the, the uh, little learning system uh, saw these displays and uh, tried to play the game of grabbing these objects, uh, moving them, rotating them, and then dropping them when they fit over a black cutout in the background to win points, just like the uh, Atari game. And uh, so uh, these are the different shapes that we used. Um, you can see in any given display, there were four background shapes and uh, some number of foreground shapes. I think there was up to five. And um, we used a neural network very similar to the, uh, the one I showed you before. Again, it's a bitmap input. It goes through several layers of the neural network. It figures out which one of the actions would produce the greatest possible reward. These are the possible actions. It can step up, down, left, or right. It can rotate. It can grab. It can release. If it's holding something, it can rotate it left, clockwise, or counterclockwise. And then, so it goes and picks it up. It moves it. It rotates it. it when it's positioned right, it lets go and uh, gets points. And this neural network learns to do the task very well. Um, so we gave it some opportunities to do this task. We just presented one object and one background shape, and uh, we calculated the minimum number of steps it would take to put it through the right hole, and we found that the networks were very reliably doing this in almost the optimal number of steps. Uh, we gave them choices. We would present two movable shapes and two background cutouts and give the network the choice. Which one would you like to, to use? And it would prefer the more symmetric one, the one with greater symmetry. The reason why was because they actually could be solved in fewer moves. And so the network's sort of value associated with the ones that are more symmetrical because there's many more possible positions such that it'll fit. It preferred that. It would choose to do those first. So it developed a preference for symmetry just out of doing this little task. And uh, it learned distributed representations that seemed to capture some of the similarities and the properties of these objects. And interestingly enough, its representations were sharper just as it was grabbing the object than while it was still moving around waiting to grab it. Um, so I was pretty excited by that, right? We've got a little neural network that kind of learns through just interacting with this little toy environment to build up uh, intuition, in a sense, about shape. And uh, so it's clearly, um, in, in this preference sort of experiment, it's sort of recognizing which type of shape it is and solving, solving the task in almost a minimum number of moves, um, indicating that it really appreciates what kinds of actions will be required to actually solve the problem. So maybe this is a first step towards actually understanding the acquired grounding of mathematical intuitions. And um, luckily, I'm going to have to end it pretty nearly here because I'm almost out of time. But I will say that, of course, I recognize that this is only the beginning. And so I'm, you know, in questions, you can ask me how I can possibly imagine advancing this further. Um, I recognize that mathematics involves relating objects and diagrams to formal expressions and statements in natural language. And, um, and it involves solving problems using manipulation of formal expressions in which diagrams may not occur. If I may give you just the formal expressions, and you have to manipulate them to show me that you figured out the answer. And here's, a, here's an example question, uh, which I wish, I hope, someday before I'm no longer able to continue to work uh, on these things. I'll be able to have an artificial neural network solved. Uh, just to illustrate some of these things, you have to look at this diagram, appreciate the relationships expressed in it by these lines, um, uh, keep track of what is being referred to by the different expressions there, use the information given, and then also write down a bunch of algebraic expressions which allow you to derive the answer. That, that's going to be pretty cool. So 
yes, I said this is only the beginning, but I would argue, and this is something that many mathematical educators have argued, that maintaining engagements with the objects and relationships captured in mathematical expressions lies at the heart of what it means to understand a mathematical argument. What it means to answer that question is to write down the series of algebraic expressions that capture the series, a set of relationships that you can derive from each other by utilizing your knowledge and principles of geometry rather than just by manipulating expressions. And um, I, uh, I, sh I think I should stop. So I will uh, say, you'll have to ask me uh, if you want to know what my future steps might look like. Oh, I just wish we <laughs> 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 yeah.